Awake and revived, refreshed, and ready to go. My name is Sheena Wyatt. I am chairing your session here today. You're not here to listen to me in any way whatsoever. So, very quickly, I'm going to hand over to Nigel Payne, who's our first speaker in this session this afternoon. And okay, together with Margaret and also with Tom, they're going to talk to you about building an organizational learning culture. So, over to you, Nigel. Thank you, Sheena. I just need the clicker. Where did that disappear to? Have we got the clicker? <laughs> This is a great start. It was there. It was there. Anyway, I just talk until someone finds it for me. Thanks a lot for coming. I'm absolutely astonished that a, a session that doesn't have AI in the title <laughs> got more than three people. So congratulations. You're the smart ones. So we're talking about organizational culture. Uh, I think it's really important. I think it's misunderstood. And no one's really thought about it much for 20 years. So I'm writing the book. My next book, which is just about finished, is on how you develop a learning culture inside an organization. And I've only got a few minutes, so I'm not going to be able to do very much. The first thing I'm going to do is just give you my Twitter, LinkedIn, and email address. So if you want to follow up on anything, I'm more than happy to do that. And what I was going to do, rather than have you the total tedium of reading the book, I'm going to tell you the big idea that comes out of it. So hey, I've just saved you 30 quid and two weeks of your life. This is the big idea. This is my big idea that uh, emerges out of the research and out of the organizational case studies. Hello. Out of the organizational case studies. And that big idea doesn't look much like a big idea. It looks like a very old idea. But the idea is that a learning culture acts as an organizational gyroscope. And what that means is that as we enter into turbulent times and as we work through uncertainty, there has to be a way for the organization to keep on that even keel, to steer, to steer through the turbulence. And that's what a good, strong learning culture in an organization does. It becomes the organizational gyroscope. And there's plenty of evidence that those organizations with strong learning cultures are able to weather pretty much any storm. Those who have neither an organizational, strong organizational culture nor a learning culture tend to smack into the first big problem that confronts them. So I think that's important. I think it's increasingly important. And that's why I think people should start to consider the nature of a learning culture and how they can build one. I can do a little bit in this session, but there's a lot more. And you'll get some really good stuff from the other speakers. Kathleen's going to talk, talk uh, Margaret's going to talk much more about uh, values and values-driven organizations. That's a part of learning culture. And Tom is going to give us a case study from AXA, turning, going from a more conventional, compliance-led, course-based learning operation to one that tries to embrace a learning culture for every member of staff. So this is what I'm going to do. This is my bit of an overview. And then I'm going to do some first steps for the learning team. It's really simple. And I'm going to take it one by one. The first thing, just reflect for a second on what you think a learning culture is. We're not going to have a lot of time to discuss it. Maybe I'll come back to it at the end. But just think about what it is. That a lot of organizations who have boast proudly about their learning culture often means at the worst level we have an LMS or at another level we started to have a corporate university. Neither of those things have got very much to do with the learning culture. I think it's much more intrinsic, much more profound in an organization. And having lots of learning does not equal learning culture. A learning culture is not about the volume of learning times the number of staff you know, divided by 100. And the higher the percentage, the more profound your learning culture is. So what do you think it is? And then do you think you have one? And why do you think you have one? So I'm not gonna, we're not going to have time to really discuss those questions. But I think you should consider them at the very least. What is it? Do you have one? And if you think you have, what, it, what does it actually mean? And I'm going to try and give you a very simple framework now to help you answer those questions in your head. And this is the result of 
the research. But these are some of the strong determining factors of a learning culture. And as you see, there's nothing that says lots of courses or uh, we changed our LMS last year and it's now more human. The, the focus when looking at the organizations I looked at come into these kinds of areas. The first one is that where there's no collaboration, there's no learning culture. So it's not about individuals doing lots of stuff. It's individuals sharing lots of stuff. And sharing becomes second nature in organizations. One of the case studies I've got in the book is a WD-40 company. You thought they just sold stuff that goes tch -tch and, and uh, lubricates the world. That's, that's basically what they do. But they've got a fascinating culture, which is they've grown from, in the last 10 years, they've grown from a $200 million turnover to a $1.1 billion turnover. How do they do that? By taking that one product and creating literally thousands of products based on it by moving into different countries. They sell the product in 140 companies. 10 years ago, they sold it in two or three countries. There's a continuous learning environment. The chief executive, the, the, the common parlance when you meet is, what did you learn today? That's part of the culture of the organization. And what that means is, it's not just about, oh, I read this amazing blog by X. It's, we, we screwed up in Moscow, we thought this, and this is what actually happened. There's an honest churning of insight across the whole organization. And they have this little storage facility. I think they call it something like blue box. It's, but basically, everything they know is available to everybody. So the organization is transparent. Salaries are transparent, roles are transparent, and so is all of their product ideas, their marketing, their processes. Everything is accessible to anyone in the organization because they want people to draw on all of what they know to create more of what they know or, or more of what they should know. So collaboration is the basis of innovation. That's their belief, and I, I tend to agree with them. The second one is about having a clear idea of the kind of organization you work for. So it's not just saying we have a mission, purpose, and values, and it's, stuck, it's on our website, and it's also at reception. It's a deep and profound understanding right through the organization of what the organization does and what my particular contribution to that organization is. That's amazingly significant and important. And all of the organizations that I profiled have very strong values. Sometimes they're articulated, but sometimes they're not. So it's not a case of having to write it down. It's a case of people having a common understanding of the kind of place they, they work in and the kind of people they work with. So for example, one of the companies I, I talked to was HT2, Ben Betts' organization, down in the exhibition floor. And Ben, they have remote workers and they have workers in their, their head office. Every single day, they phone every single remote worker for at least 10 minutes to find out how they're going, what they're doing. And whenever they have kind of sessions at the, in, the, in the workplace, every remote worker is invited in. And when they, they have a, a fun time at four, four o'clock on a Friday, so that's actually 11 o'clock US Eastern, where their Boston office is, everyone stops work, wherever they happen to be, if you're working at home, working in Boston, working in Oxford, and you, you join in. There's a huge effort to make everybody feel that they're the exactly equally part of the organization wherever they happen to be. And it's an organization like all of the ones that I profiled where asking for help is second nature. If you don't know something, you ask. If you're stuck, you ask. If you can't do, you ask. It's not a place where it's embarrassing to admit what you don't know. It's kind of not embarrassing not to admit what you don't know. And a lot of their a lot of their one-to-ones, like many of the other organizations, are based on little informal walk and talks, constant engagement between staff to build that collaboration, to build that innovation. And everyone who works in the vast majority of the organizations I talk to has an endearing passion for the organization. So even people who've left 
will talk about what a great place it was to work. And all of the ones that had a learning culture, the, de the view was if you leave, learn more and come back. Stay our friend. We, we understand we can't keep you here, but doesn't mean we have to lose you forever. And in, in one of the other companies, which is Degreed, based in San Francisco, in Degreed, they have a, a kind of obsession with work-life balance. And, and the, the basic view in Degreed is, work is only work. There's the rest of your life. So what are you doing about the rest of your life? There is interest in people's rest of their life as they are about their work. And that, that interest translates directly into motivation and engagement. And one of, their, one of their explicit values that the chief executive came, for, came, uh, came up with is when it's over, it's over. I, I think that's really profound. What it means is that, hey, you're not, we're not flogging dead horses in this company. If we, if we can't deliver and we can't do what we want to do with the passion and the engagement, we'll just walk away. We'll all walk away. And because it's still a small company, they encourage staff to walk away. You've been here 18 months. You've learned a lot. Go take it elsewhere. That's fine. We understand that. We get it. So that reflects back on a real go the extra mile for the organization amongst the staff. So however remote they happen to be, there's a passionate belief in the organization. And then fundamentally, Trust is rippling through every organization. So a learning organization cannot be a learning organization without trust. Trust is fundamental. And trust gives you permission to admit when you don't know. Trust allows you to fail and not feel you're going to be fired. Trust allows you to build strong internal relationships and collaboration. And what also becomes part of trust is the ability to be outside the organization. Because one of the other factors that, that uh, is very clear from the organizations is that they bring knowledge in. They constantly, they never think they know, and they never think they know enough. So you're not, you're not persecuted because you happen to be part of an external network. The previous session was about networks. And these organizations encourage people to have networks. They don't say, what the hell are you doing there? Why aren't you, in the, why aren't you here? Why did you go to that? No, you can't go to a conference. It costs too much. They don't say you can go to any conference that you want to go to, but they do encourage organi organize, uh, the individuals in the organization to bring stuff in from outside, not occasionally, but on a regular basis. And you, you're trusted that if you're out there, you're doing useful stuff, not only for yourself, but for the organization. And the final one is that, and, and this kind of picks up the technology piece, that in, in the early writing about learning companies and learning organizations in the 80s, the one glaring omission was any reference to technology at all. Partly because it was the 80s, but partly because they were so inwardly focused on processes that it was all about process. Now, I don't think it necessarily is all about process. It's more about what Margaret's going to talk about. It's more about values and attitude and the feeling good about the organization and wanting to learn and being encouraged to learn. But one of the key things around technology is places to share. If you've got nowhere to share, if you keep stuff yourself privately, if there are no collaborative spaces, then it's unlikely you're going to be a very successful learning organization. So every single one of the companies, big and small, had built collaborative spaces of some sort. And almost more collaborative emphasis on collaborative spaces than on courses, more on resources than courses, more on cur curation and sharing than on courses. And add all those together, add the collaboration, the strong sense of values, very, very intense trust, places to share real, probably and virtual rather than or, or, or virtual, and you begin to get a sense of what I found in those organizations. And where there's a strong learning culture, the organization is different from one that has lots of learning, let's say. And the staff in the organization feel differently about the place they work. And their level of activity is higher. And often the organizations are far more innovative and far more productive than those that don't have it. 
So let's talk about the role of the learning team. So what is a learning team? Is a learning team necessary in a learning culture? Well, it, it's not necessary in the sense that it's got to put, do stuff, but it is necessary in these few areas. The first one is that I believe really strongly that a learning team that doesn't defend the culture, either the culture's rotten or it's a bad learning team. You've got to get at, someone has to defend that culture and ensure that it continues generation after generation and it's imbued from the minute you walk through the door as a new start. And many of the people I talked to were very, very passionate about the way they on, onboarded people, not necessarily in formal programs, but they didn't let anyone spend more than a few seconds before they were deeply imbued in the organization. The second thing is creating experiences, building the experiences that create the learning, not creating the learning. If you see the distinction, it's a huge Ex distinction. We're going to hear much, much more about building experiences because experiences change people's behaviour. Experiences deeply engage in a way that perhaps a programme or a course or something more formal doesn't. And someone has to tell learning story. Someone has to alert the organisation to how far it's come, alert the organisation to what it means to learn and what that learning has done for individuals and for the organization. So most of the learning organizations that I looked at in those companies had some role in collecting, sharing, sometimes eulogizing, making heroes of individuals, but with, always with a focus on telling learning story. And being, oh, whoops, sorry, being facilitative, in other words, helping things along, not running them, not controlling, facilitating, but also governance. You know, how do you manage all this stuff? That's really important. So they're just a little teeny snapshot. But I, I know from having spent you know, the last year or so deeply diving deeply into this, it's important. It's going to be more and more important, I think, as we move forward. And I'll stop, and I'll hand over to Margaret. And Margaret's going to take on the mantle of the values. Off you go, Margaret. Ta -ta -ta -ta. <laughs> Whoop. One second. Am I on? And I'm not sure. Here we go. Yep, Let me just get this a little closer. So I haven't ever had one of these on my back. It makes me feel like I'm a Madonna with a monkey. <laughs> I kind of want to break out into song. Um, I am Margaret Kelsey, and I am the director of education and training for the Barrett Value Center, uh, which was originally based in London. We're now headquartered in the US. And uh, I'm here to talk with you about why culture and values matter. And it's wonderful to follow Nigel, because I think we're going to have a, a delicious dovetail of ideology and topics for you. So first, the first time I came to LT was in uh, 2006. How many were at that conference, 2006? All right, so not so many. I don't know if you recall or not, but at the end of that conference, we surmised that as professionals, we had a charge before us. And that was primarily to be you know, like the learning evangelists shouting and touting the benefits of blended learning. And I could say, looking at what we've done here, how we've grown, and looking at what we've done with the exhibit floor, that we have truly succeeded in that mission. I think we can all give ourselves a pat on the back for that. But we now have before us, as a body of professionals, I think an entirely new charge. And that new charge has to do with exactly this, paying attention to culture and paying attention to what's happening within the organization in a whole new, different kind of way. The uh, Gartner Group, financial group, came out in 2016 with some great research. And they basically found it and said the biggest threat, as we know, to the succession or to, the, to innovation is internal politics and an organizational culture which cannot and doesn't accept failure or any ideas except from the outside and cannot change. Clearly, what is the operative word here? Organizational culture. And as we know, in the last three years, we just keep hearing this buzzword, culture, culture, culture. How many people have read something in the last two years on culture? 
why you're here. It's becoming a new business onto itself. It's not going away. And so what do we really mean by culture? Well, I'm going to give you a very simple definition. You know, it's kind of what you feel, how you feel when you walk into a place. You can feel the culture when you walk into a place to get your dog groomed or when you walk into a bank or when you go for a burger. Every place has its unique vibe. And what it does, though, is it reflects the values, beliefs, and behaviors of the leaders of the group, the people who are the most influential in a group. So for example, you may have also, let's, be, let's distinguish between influencers and leaders. You may have your CEO, but you may also have a very, very disgruntled VP. Who's potentially going to influence the department more? Might just be that really disgruntled VP. So we have to pay attention to how leadership and influence are wed together. But basically what we say really, it's the way things are done around here. What are values? Well, let's talk a little bit about that, such that they are really what motivates us. They reflect our met and unmet needs, and they're really our energetic drivers. Like, we get passion from our values. We feel something. We have um, training partners around the world. One of them, Kathleen Seely, runs an organization. She likes to describe values as sort of beliefs with a punch, a bit of a power. Now, here's what's something that's sort of unique. A lot of times we think of values as being positive, right? Only positive. We don't think of anything being negative. Well, for the most part, values are positive, but there can be limiting expressions of them. And that happens when there's an overfocus. And that overfocus has to do with any fear that is showing up. Talk a little bit about what that looks like. So where does this model also, the seven levels of consciousness model in, in Richard Barrett's work, um, and how this uh, plays in here? So folks are all familiar with the hierarchy of needs, right? You know, Abraham Maslow. So what Richard did is kind of something brilliant. He said, you know, I think that's great. Of course we're going to evolve. We're going to be paying attention to our needs, our physiological needs, our sense of safety, our, our looking and need to feel a sense of belonging. And then, you know, as we grow and mature, we're going to get a sense of who we are and what we can contribute to the world, and ideally eventually self-actualize. Hopefully that happens by the time we are 30. Sometimes it doesn't feel like it happens until we're 55. But if we do self-actualize, he then said, you know, something else kind of happens after that. It just doesn't end there. <laughs> we keep going. And what happens is we ask, we start with looking for internal cohesion around the question of, what is my purpose? And then next, how do I really want to live my purpose? And then what does it mean to really be my purpose? And that's what we see happens in the fifth, sixth, and seventh levels. And so what he did is he kind of just substituted needs for levels of consciousness. If you don't like the word consciousness, because maybe it sounds too woo, you can also say <coughs> levels of awareness. You are becoming aware of these different levels. And again, really what they also reflect is we've got base needs and growth needs. So we're at the bottom here, we're paying attention to our physiological needs, our emotional needs uh, for belonging, our emotional needs for um, being able to express our skills and our talents and our um, best qualities. And then once we've gotten our ability to manage any fears that might show up around taking care of these base needs, that's when we're truly able to self-actualize and seek autonomy and freedom, independence and adventure, so that we can then find that purpose in life, be able to actualize it and influence others, and then really lead and do something that leads a legacy or has greater significance for ourselves and others. Now, what's important to recognize when you are developing content, when we are designing training programs, is that at any given time, our values are going to reflect our unmet and met needs as well as our personal growth. So if, for instance, I'm struggling financially, that's going to show up a little bit in how I'm looking for work. Or if I'm really feeling quite confident in who I am and what I want to contribute, well, I might start to think about a way I can put myself out there and want to write an article or get out there and look for something. But what we see is we're going to, based on our own consciousness, evolve and pay attention to our base needs and growth needs. And that's what we have to do as learning professionals, is recognize everyone coming into our training doors, through our doors, 
they too have base needs and growth needs. For every value, you can associate it with one of these levels. And so that's what we see here. The Barrett value system has done that. We've gone ahead and identified the values that associate with each of these different levels on the personal, as well as the organizational. As an exercise, what I'm going to ask you to do just to show how this plays out. Everybody just um, raise one hand and keep it up while I read something. Imagine you're all this. And, and what I'm going to ask you to do is keep your hands up. I'm going to read about organizations. And I want you to place, bring your hand down when what I've read no longer aligns with your organization and what it expresses and what it demonstrates. So. First, we'll start here with survival. Imagine a company, your company, is conscious and fair in a way it sets its prices and pay because it's moved beyond fear and driven greed. Hopefully, all everyone where you work, you all feel that you have that in place. It's now profitable financially and stable, and it creates good shareholder return. It also provides safe and comfortable working conditions for all its people. Let's go to level two. Does your organization offer this? When people walk into the office each day, they smile, and they greet each other warmly, and there's a healthy sense of respect, and customers feel well looked after. Now at level three, does your organization still offer? High-performing systems. You train your people to be excellent at doing their jobs, and staff are proud to tell others that they work with you, you and you're proud to tell others that you work with them. At level four, this is transformational here. Your organization moves forward through innovation and continuous improvement. It has the adaptability and resilience to weather tough times, and people feel empowered and have the courage to ask tough questions, and it's okay to make mistakes. Okay. Notice how hands are starting to go down, right? This is what happens. At level five, we find internal cohesion. People feel inspired by the vision and the values. There are high levels of trust and a deep sense of purpose, fun, and team spirit. Okay. And now at level six, we find making a difference is what's really at play here. Your organization is collaborative. People are, uh, you've got a win-win for yourself, for your clients, for your customers, everyone who is invested. There's a sense of leadership development, and leaders are making a sustainable difference within your organization and outside. We're up to level seven. All right, at level seven, this is a level where ethics is not just about compliance anymore, but truly doing what they believe is right down deep in their hearts. And there's a knowing that you're making a difference. That's great. So how many people's hands are still up? Who do you work for? Who do you work for? Nice job. So these are places that you might want to talk to with these employees. And <laughs> Holton, Maine is calling me. Sorry, <laughs> we're busy at the moment. Um, um, so as you can see, that's these, or, th these folks who still have their hands raised up. It's because they have that, their organizations are practicing what we call full spectrum awareness. Now, entropy, let's talk a little bit about entropy. Uh, entropy is the personal amount of fear, the amount of fear that shows up and it can influence your own personal life as well as an organ, within an organization. And when your hands were going down, it's because entropy was present, likely, in your organization. On the personal side, it's really a, mass, a measure of someone's sense of lack of personal mastery. So if you're feeling fear, you're going to have a little entropy somewhere. For an organization, it's going to show up and it's going to reflect the amount of energy that gets spent on unproductive stuff. Like, how many times do you stand around a water cooler wondering, like, why, are this, why does this problem keep happening? And really, what it has to do with answering these questions you know, do I have enough? Am I loved enough? Am I recognized enough? And on the organizational side, what will show up is on the first level, you'll see things like control, greed, exploitation. On the second, manipulation, blame. On the third, bureaucracy. What we want to do is we want to recognize as trainers now in the body of learning and development prof um, professionals, we have a new charge, I think, really. And that new charge is to consider how we are much more going to become cultural ambassadors. 
So we're not just designing programs anymore, but now we're designing them because we're paying attention to the values that people are bringing into their organizations, as well as the organizational values. And what you want to do to create a thriving learning culture, which Nigel alluded to, is pay attention to how there's alignment between the personal values and the current values that your organization holds. And so we look to get our needs met. We enter. You know, we don't leave our values at the door when we show up at work. We bring them with us. We bring our whole bodies to work. And so we're going to see whether or not there's that kind of alignment. And at a certain point, when there's not enough alignment, that's when we start to look for a new job. And in order to create change, positive change within an organization, your organization, you're also going to want to see how you can tap your own strengths, your own courage, your own growth values, and how you can bring them forward to create a desired culture. And you're also going to look to see how, in your desire to express your growth needs, your growth values, are you being supported to do so? So right now, for everyone who raised their hand and didn't get beyond you know, level four or five, you might be asking yourself, what more can I do to encourage my leadership group, my leadership organization, to invite ways in which other people can rise up to create the desired culture? And as we do that, what we do is we then create more internal cohesion, improve staff engagement, growth, and sustainability. What the Barrett Value System tools do, and I'm not getting into them now because that's like part two. <laughs> I want to leave time for Tom. Um, we have a way of introducing indices, surveys that you can take, where you can get a full assessment of your culture's, your organization's culture. Sorry, what we what we are able to determine is really we do these plot diagrams, and we can identify what everyone is walking in with. <laughs> and then what your culture, your organization, sorry, is demonstrating in its current state, and what we think needs to happen for the desired state. And when you can create that kind of alignment, that's where you really feel like you've got one of those organizations that's just buzzing. Next steps, um, please, if you'd like to learn more about this, uh, you can email me at margaret, M-A-R-G-A-R-E-T, at values center with a T-R-E dot com at the end. And I can also help direct you to how you can take a personal values assessment. It's complimentary. And talk to you about any of these things as well. And now for more case study, I'm going to turn it over to Tom. Thank you very much. OK, so I'm going to jump on the stage. And I saw somebody fall off the stage earlier, so I'm going to try and not do that today. So good afternoon. I'm Tom Bailey, and I'm Learning Experience Manager from AXA. So I've got the very fortunate task of following two extremely well-known industry leaders. But I'm not them, and I'm not here to do what they've just done. My role is to talk about what it's like on the ground and what's really happening in a large organization like AXA. So for the next 15 minutes, I'm going to talk about what learning looked like at AXA historically why now is a great time for us to really change that culture, and what it is specifically that we've been focusing on as an organization. And finally, we'll share with you an award-winning blended learning campaign which we delivered, and which really helped transform the way that we serve our customers. But before I begin, and sorry if your hands are tired, I'm going to make you put your hands up again. Hands up if anyone's had an AXA insurance policy in their lives. You can admit it. OK, so quite a few of you. Now, same question again. Hands up if you've ever had an insurance policy from any of these brands. So TUI, British Gas, M&S. We've got Post Office, Swift Cover. OK, so quite a few hands there again. What's interesting here is that the second group of people, you may have actually been AXA customers without knowing it. And that's because a lot of our policies are sold through that strength of our retail partner brands. And in fact, one in five people in the UK have an AXA insurance policy. And we're also the number one global insurance brand for the ninth year running. I'm not showing off. What I'm getting at here is that we're a huge organization. We've got over 150,000 employees across 52 different countries. But no matter how big we are, it doesn't mean that we're not under threat from those smaller, more agile companies. And I read the other day there's over 150 new insurance technology companies being founded every single year. So the only way that we can respond to this is to keep learning, keep innovating, and keep transforming as a business. But how did we used to learn at AXA? 
So historically at AXA, L&D looked very different to how it is today. Historically, our L&D teams had two real roles. They could put people in a classroom, or they could put people through their mandatory compliance training. Does that sound familiar to a few of you? Yeah, OK, I thought so. But it's very different today. Um, and that was, a, that was my experience when I joined AXA as well. I've got a quick story to share with you. So when I joined AXA, I found that Excel, and more specifically, pivot tables were a way of life in my department. I didn't have a clue how to use pivot tables, so I spoke to my manager who put me in touch with our L&D team. And they very kindly offered me a two-day advanced Excel course down in London with an external trainer. So a few months later, I jumped on a train, off I went down to London, and sat through probably the most boring days of my life. But I came back into work on the following Monday, eager to use my new skills. Sat down, opened up my laptop, logged in, <laughs> launched Excel, completely forgotten how to use pivot tables. And it's quite a quick example, but it's very true of traditional classroom-based training, where we know that knowledge retention is, is really low. And we really do need to minimize that gap between what people learn and when they can put that into practice. So for us, something really needed to change. And having had enough of pivot tables, I joined the L&D team about two years ago, and we made some huge changes. So previously, our L&D teams were sat in the individual business areas across AXA. But now we're acting as a centralized UK center of excellence across our about 9,500 employees. And what this did is it allowed us to move away from being order takers. And we could actually take a step back and, and stop just offering a menu of training courses. And we can now provide that support and structure to really enable our employees to drive their own personal and professional development. And the focus for us now is really around relearning, um, building that learning culture, increasing the engagement with learning, and also really influencing and changing that employee experience instead of just learning for learning's sake, which is probably what we did historically. So in our transition from a very <coughs> traditional L&D team to that modern learning organization, we're focusing on a few key areas. So why culture? And for us, our definition of culture is driving people towards that self-directed culture of learning where, where people are driving their own development. Secondly, around learning experience, we're focusing more on engagement and delivering those really impactful and personalized learning experiences. And finally, the learning offer. And what I mean by this is we're providing much easier access to the right resources and courses at the right time and place for our employees. So I'll just cover these in a little bit more detail now. So our first area is around culture. And here it's how we're exploring how we can shift from employees waiting to be told what to learn to them actually driving their own development. And we know that we're not going to build a learning culture by simply saying we have one. It really does need to be grown organically. And there's a number of ways we do, in which we're doing this. I've provided a few examples there. And one of the ways that we are doing it is we're really shifting those um, performance management conversations to not only really just focus on the performance gaps, but have those true meaningful conversations around development, goal setting, future opportunities. And a big shift occurred for us when we recognized how key that role of the manager was in organically growing a culture of learning. We know that employees are much more likely to engage in that learning if that directive and also the continued support is coming from their managers. And very closely linked to that culture is experience. So we're putting a lot of energy into how we position ourselves as an L&D team. And as part of this new approach, we held two Learning at Work Week campaigns in 2017. And what these were, these were effectively week-long, very full-on marketing campaigns, really focusing on the visibility and awareness of learning in the workplace. And they're a huge success for us. So during both of the campaigns, we found there's a 400% increase in engagement with our content, with our courses, with our platforms. And we've also started now doing monthly learning at work communications, which again is bringing that visibility and awareness of learning in the workplace. And what we do is we align these communications to business topics, bringing learning into the rhythm of the business, which has made a big difference for us as an L&D team. And finally, taking this campaign-based approach has also helped us to really drive engagement when we do any bespoke workshops, programs, or campaigns. And finally, when it comes to the learning offer, we've had a huge focus around content curation over the past year. So we've now got a catalogue of over 7,500 different digital learning courses and resources. So we've got LinkedIn Learning, TED Talk, Skillpill, Litmus Heroes. We've got a lot of content in there, as well as SME content as well. 
But we're, of course, aware back to Nigel's point that content doesn't equal culture. But what it does is it, it means we don't have to just put people in a classroom. We can actually blend our solutions. We can point people to resources. And more importantly, our employees now have choice. And they can really choose what it was they want to learn based on their own goals and ambitions. OK, so so far we've seen why we needed to change as, as an organization, what we've been doing around culture, what we've been doing around that experience, and what we've been doing around the offer. But what does this look like in practice? So what I'm about to share with you is a real life example of where we've de de developed and delivered a blended learning campaign based approach. And these lovely people you can see on screen are our Glasgow team leaders. And back to my earlier point, it was really crucial for us to deliver this program through our team leaders rather than just sending in the L&D team like we might have done historically. So this is the program, Inspiring Customer First. So why was this so important for our business? Well, first of all, our contact centre in Glasgow had recently moved into a new, shiny new office, and we really wanted to match our customer culture to that cutting-edge office environment that we are in. And in addition to this, we wanted to really change the way that we served our customers, moving away from transactional-based interactions, speaking to them like their policies, to actually building real relationships with customers and offering that personalised service. And it really was a huge scale behavioural change for us, and we really needed something which was completely different to anything we'd done before. And it was designed to inspire, educate, and upskill our customer-facing staff. So to deliver this intended approach, we went down that campaign-based approach to learning. And we first held a launch day around a month before the actual training campaign began. And this is where we introduced our logo. We had some customer personas built into avatars, pull-up banners, posters, email campaigns, animated videos. You know, We had the full marketing mix in there to really try and drive that awareness and engagement. And we also held an avatar competition. So these two people on the screen are actually Jody and Ian, who work in our contact center. And they won, I know, that's great. And they won that competition to be dropped into our virtual customer world. And finally, in readiness for the launch, we also held a train the trainer session for both our team leaders and managers, because we really needed to upskill them in the facilitation and coaching skills that they needed to really help us land this with their people. And why that was so important is because we wanted it to be from them, for them, and embedded by them as well over the next few years. So how do we maximize engagement? Well, following that initial teaser campaign, we, we really went into that week with our employees fully engaged, and we've never had that before. But during the week itself, we actually delivered five minutes of bite-sized micro digital learning. And this was wrapped around by a 10-minute hub session, which was run by the team leaders, and it's a very interactive and engaging session. Uh, absolutely wasn't in the classroom. It was right where they work. And in these hub sessions, our employees would make daily pledges, and they'd also start to put into practice what they'd learned straight away by jumping back on the phones and speaking to real customers, really minimizing that gap between what they'd learned and when they could put it into practice. And to continue driving engagement throughout the week, we held a number of challenges. One of the ones which drove the most engagement was called a cracking call challenge. And what we did here is we put all of our best calls into a cracking call library. And what's great is that that library has now become an ongoing resource for our employees, and become such an important part of the ongoing embedding going forward. And finally, another big change. On the Friday, instead of putting our employees through a 10-question, multiple-choice assessment like we always do, we decided to drop them into this virtual customer world. And they could actually interact with virtual customers face-to-face -face and have real conversations with them. And depending on how well those conversations went with those customers, the, um, they would collect gold stars. They'd unlock other parts of the game, and they'd also go on to collect their Inspiring Customer First trophy at the end. And I don't have an example of the game, but on the right-hand side, there's a little gauge where you saw how well the customer satisfaction and net promoter score was increasing based on your interactions. So as you can see, this was a completely new approach to training and employee engagement. And we also produced a quick video showreel from the week, which I'd now like to share with you. Let's take a look. Helen had delivered in those small chunks as you went along, uh, I think made all the difference uh, and really made it stand out against maybe previous training we'd had. We just got really involved in it, so it's probably the first training I've had where I haven't felt like I could go to sleep. <laughs> it was different because it was quick, it was easy and it was fun. It's been really interactive, um, the buzz in the department's been great, um, the team have really enjoyed it, everybody's been up for the kind of daily challenges with the modules. We have built a programme that 
takes real scenarios, real conversations we've had with our customers. We have used our real employees uh, with the avatars that we've built into the programme with Jody and Ian in there. And I believe that this year-long programme will make a real change to our attitudes and our behaviours in order to create a real customer culture. Um, I will encourage and continue to encourage the peer-to-peer -peer coaching because it definitely works and it's, it, it, it helps everybody else. No, just hearing from the manager all the time, it's just facilitating that peer-to-peer -peer coaching is definitely the one going forward. Just I thought it was really well done, really well put together and I would like to see Axel use this as a more a method for doing the training going forward and that sort of style would be a lot better. Have we got any Glaswegians in the room? <laughs> Yeah, so, so for the rest of you, I probably should have put subtitles on there, so I apologise. But historically, we would have probably delivered that as part of a one or two day classroom based training with, in all honesty, little or no impact. But for us, the transformation that we achieved is evidence that taking that campaign based approach with blended learning and supported by our team leaders is the most effective way for us to deliver results for our business. And to further evidence this transformation, we also picked up a couple of little awards last month as well. So we picked up Gold Award for Best Use of Blended Learning at the Learning Technologies Awards. And we also picked up Silver Award for Best Customer Service Program at the Training Journal Awards. And I think for us, this is fantastic recognition for how far we've come and that transformation we've been through as an L&D team. And some very final thoughts from me before I hand back over to Sheena and the Q&A. So I really want to emphasize how big a shift this is for AXA as an organization, and it's absolutely one that we needed to make. Having that self-directed learning culture will mean that we've got more happier, more engaged, and more proactive workforce, and ones that are really constantly <coughs> innovating and trying to make things better for our customers and for our business. And finally, for us as L&D professionals, I believe we should move away from force-feeding our employees with training courses, and instead really focus on that engagement and empowering our employees to drive their own development. So that's all for me. Thanks for listening, and I'll hand back over to Sheena. Now it's your turn. <laughs> now it's time now to take our three fantastic speakers after that session and actually quiz them, pick their brains. So guys, would you like to come on up so people can um, see you? And I throw it out to the room. If anybody has a question for either Tom, Margaret, or Nigel, now is the time. I will come and find you. Um, Please don't be in the middle, because that could be a little bit interesting. Um, but we'll have a go. Yes. Yeah, it's a great question, thank you. So I think for us to begin with, we really wanted to drive the awareness and engagement of learning in the workplace and really try and drive that, that culture where people really understand what's available to them and, and they can have that choice. Around structured programmes, I'd say we haven't actually delivered anything yet around a structured programme. We're more focusing on embedding learning in the HR policies. So for example, we've got the performance management conversations now have a goal setting section of them and that part of that goal setting the managers have been upskilled to really try and drive the engagement of learning and get people to you know help themselves i think that's that's a big thing for us really that helps Yeah, unfortunately we don't. Um, we've got very small resource when it comes to digital. We've got no authors, we've got no marketing people within our team. But we do have a, a great UK internal comms team. So they really helped us with our comms campaign to help drive that and really drive the engagement through the different channels. But with the visuals and the actual programme itself, we worked with an external vendor. So we worked with Sponge on the actual the digital side of it. Thank you. 
speak for Nigel, but for anybody. Um, in the research that you did, you, you talked about the different sort of um, indicators of uh, learning cultures um, that are properly embedded in organisations. Where do they stem from? So uh, do they do they spring newly formed as startups with that culture? Is there some kind of CEO champion? Um, where, where, what gives birth? It's a that's a, a really good question. And. Um Unfortunately, they don't spring newly formed into the world without any effort going on and uh, and, uh, under normal circumstance. Uh, what I, I think it's absolutely clear from all of the, 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 the people I talk to that if there's no buy-in at the top, then it all goes horribly wrong somewhere down in the middle. So that it's not just uh, having a CEO saying, this is great. It's, it's having deep belief in what the organization is trying to do, confidence and trust in the staff, and a sense that the organization is not just designed to make the senior people look good and make them rich. It's actually about a community inside which links to a community outside. So many of those organizations are very, very strong leaky bridges out, or that's a mixed metaphor, strong connections out into their community, whether that is whether that is their geographical community or their community of customers, and so that there's a, a kind of communal sense of whatever they happen to be doing is doing good in the world. Like you know, WD40 is essentially an oil, but their belief is that they are making people's lives easier, and they collect stories from thousands. They've got thousands. Of, they have a thousand eight-second videos. Of, of how you use WD-40 to change your life. So basically, the, the fundamental belief is, I'm not just working for a boring company that puts stuff in an aerosol can, I'm actually helping people unstick their lives. I'm helping people transform their lives. And the stories are all about uh, grooms about to get in their car to go to their wedding and they can't get the door open because it's frozen, and out comes the WD-40. <laughs> The door opens, they get, to the, they get to the church. I just thought I'd tell you guys, you, you saved everything in my whole life. You know? So it's those kinds of things. It's, it's a real sense of purpose, engagement, and commitment that comes from top right the way through to the bottom. It's not a dictum, it's a belief. the very interesting uh, presentations. Um, you all had a role for learning and development in this, so I'd be interested in each of your comments on how you see the, the development of learning and development people needing to evolve as well, yes. because it sounds like very different, much more <coughs> multifaceted business cred credibility roles that you are applying. Yes. I'll start. Um, so, with the Barrett Value Center, and as the um, as the director there, what we have actually is we certify consultants around the world, and so we're actually a very small team, but we provide our services and support to organizations through our consultants. And so, one of the things that we are always engaged in is thinking through what is the win-win. So, as we design our program, we certify those who go out, and we have training partners who do that work. We always want to engage in ensuring that process is a win-win, and we're continually investing in them through our learning design and inviting back from them what they're doing in their work. And so it's an ongoing engagement. So we have to practice ourselves, our own cultural transformation as we grow and we evolve and we take on new technologies, which is always pushing our own um, envelope. Um, right now we're about to uh, launch with a new learning management system that's going to support them. And then they're going to be needing to adopt that as well. And so I think really what we're wanting to do is continually invest in and support change. And so embracing change is a fundamental core value for us, and especially around customer satisfaction and around learning. And so I think really what it's about is getting clear about what our values are and holding them, holding them dear and then living them with the people that we're working with and that we're supporting. So that's one of the things that we need to do. Great, yeah, so 
At AXA, we've seen quite a big shift in two years in the roles in the L&D team already. So I'd say two years ago, we had a majority of the team was built up of facilitators. So they were going out delivering back-to-back -back training in the classroom. And we then started to look towards, well, we, in fact, we actually completely scrapped that model and, and moved to more of a partnering model. So we've now got learning business partners out there, really building relationships with the key business stakeholders. And then we've also then now got an L&D, what we call L&D factory. So we've got a support team now. So we've got people looking after leadership and management, got somebody looking after talent, uh, experience, digital. And that's what we're really focusing on at the minute. And then another big change which we just had recently, we, we started looking at digital, so we had like a digital learning team. But the problem what happened there was that we, we started looking at digital versus face-to-face, -face, which wasn't really the right thing to do either. So now we're looking more at learning experience. So we're building a team of people who can really focus on building that culture, the marketing principles within there, and really trying to drive engagement of, of learning in the workplace. I'm not sure what's next yet, but I think we're just going to focus on that real building engagement at the minute in visibility. Can I share three words with you? Uh, the first word is translators. That someone has to take big ideas and make them tangible and real. And that's part of the role of learning and development. To be able to have a conversation at any, at any place from top down and get what that actually means in terms of, of actions. And that is, a, that is a, a growing need and a rare deliverer. No, it's not every L&D operation that sees that's part of its role. The second is a reflector. Uh, I think that a good L&D department understands where the organization is and can help the steps necessary to move in the direction required so that they, they are the kind of honest broker within the organization. And they do not have starry eyes about where learning is. And, and what they have to realize very often is that you do need campaigns and you do need to change hearts and minds because people have busy, busy lives. And they don't, learning isn't necessarily seen as a universal good in every place at every time. You might think that if you work in learning and development. So you've, you've got to be an honest reflector and understand where the organization is. And the third is you, you have to have doers. That, that you need process. This doesn't happen by a, a puff of smoke. Things need, tangible things need to happen, as well as ideas and feelings and emotions and values. And they're the ones who do stuff or help others do stuff and keep track of what they do. So they're my three words, translators, reflectors, and doers. They're the three roles required. Um, this is one for Tom. Uh, you mentioned that uh, something like that would traditionally be delivered in a day or two in the classroom. Mm -hmm. What kind of challenges did you face and most specifically how did you overcome them in, in convincing people that it's worth the extra effort, the extra resource mm -hmm. to, to put on a campaign like that as opposed to just a one day classroom course? For, for us, we were really lucky that we had some advocates in, in that business area already. It was a very specific part of AXA. So it is, it's a Glasgow contact centre that all they do is look after business insurance. And they knew that what we had wasn't working. So luckily for us, we had some really passionate people there who just said, let's do something completely different. And, and having that buy-in from the senior stakeholders really helped. Um, I think challenges were probably more those uh, customer contact centre advisors who'd been sat there for 20 years doing that job. And it's what they were used to. So almost, you know, oh, why, why are we doing this digital learning? I don't get it. Can I not just do my job? And so I think having that one month campaign, we started building engagement for four weeks before we even delivered anything. That really helped us to overcome that and get people up to speed by the time that we launched it. People remember the campaign far quicker than they far longer than they remember a one day course. Yeah. You know, that will endure, and therefore the, the ripple effect will endure. So it's, I, think it's, I think that's very important, that a campaign is often more effective than a course. And, and just to add to that, we are 12 months on, and this is still completely embedded. We've still got the pull-up yeah. banners, we've got the posters. People are talking about this. It's, it's completely a new way of, of doing work for them as well, which is great. 
for Nigel. In your research, have you seen any examples of companies that have transitioned from being maybe not the culture you were looking for to the culture you were looking for? Because I see within our organisation people doing things very quickly and I sometimes feel like shouting to slow down to go faster. How do you get all those people on board to go on yes. that that, you're making, that That's a really, really interesting and profound point. That there are huge numbers of frustrated people in the middle. So if you like, there, there are those who got there, done it, those not interested, never going to do it. But there's a big frustrated middle where organisations see the value of that transition, don't quite know how to do it, and you're right, often want to push far too fast. That, that for, as far as I'm concerned, if you haven't got it right at the top, if there isn't clarity of understanding in terms of mission purpose values, and then some idea of what needs to change. One of the things that I said in, in my leadership book is that if you can get the organization to confront the awful leadership that it delivers, you've got far more chance of getting something going than if you just say, oh, we've got to, let's put on a program. And it's true with culture. If you explore in brutal, factual detail what the culture does to individuals in it and the kind of impact, negative impact it makes on their lives, you've got a much bigger, I suppose, foundation for going forward. So that takes time and, and you know, what is the reality you're trying to change? And Having some frustrations with the organisation, or, fr or often frustrations with your staff, they bloody well don't do stuff, they, they don't ever come up with any ideas, that isn't a good base. Do something about it by next Wednesday, not a good base to proceed. So I think you're right, you've got to start with a very clear idea of where you're going to end up, and then you've got to take those steps, systematic steps, and it gets easier. It begins to become kind of self-referencing. Once you've made the first step, people come up with the ideas, suggestions are made, things happen without anyone trying to do anything. But at the beginning, it's a little like pulling teeth. If you go too fast, you actually build resistance in the very people you, you want to enable and empower. They dig their heels in and say, why do we have to do all this extra stuff on top of our jobs? So yes, you're right. You're 100% right. And ideally, one of the ways to start that is to invite measuring your culture. Find some tool. We have tools, other organizations have tools. Find some way to get leadership to buy in the value of measuring your culture so that you can have some hard data. Because when there's hard data, people are more willing to ask some of those soft questions and answer those soft questions of how did we get here and what do we really need to do to change and make things um, more employee fulfilling. And, and so look for something that will give you that concrete information. Yep. And confront reality. And confront reality, exactly. Yeah. <coughs> Look at where the fear is underneath everything that's causing some of the entropy that you might be experiencing. I spotted you. Right. Sheena, you're doing a great job. I need to learn to wear the whole body shoes is what I need to do. <laughs> Just a quick question. Uh, concerning creating a learning culture for those of us who are sort of knee-deep in it, what are some of the pitfalls um, of doing this? For us, it's the floodgates are open. We've got more requests to do really innovative experimental things than we can really do, and so we're scaling and rapid volume. But I'm curious some other things we should anticipate. Should I go? Um, what, one way you deal with that is to start to delegate. You, you start to create ownership elsewhere in the organization. So instead of you being in control of 65 experiments, you're in control of one and 64 other groups are in charge of the other 64. That really, I think that really helps. I, I think if you, if you begin to feel that it's all going to come, come through you or through your team, that there are, there are going to be some tensions further down. So that, that is one, that, that letting go and kind of trusting the staff to, to understand what's needed and do it is a massively difficult leap to make. But once you've made it, it's like you can't ever go back. Because once, once you offer that kind of trust, then it's very, very hard to see them all as a bunch of you know, lazy what's-its. You, you've, you've, you've turned a massive corner. So I, I think other pitfalls are focus. That you start to you focus on the process, not the product. 
In other words, you, you get absolutely obsessed with, let's get this, let's, let's build this culture, and you forget you've actually got to deliver products or services to customers, and you lose sight of the bigger picture. It should always be in service of the, big, of the bigger aim, not secondary. The bigger aim should not be secondary. And the third, the third major area is that you have to let things go. You have to forget stuff. You have to drop stuff. You have to stop doing things. And everyone wants to do everything and everything else. And it's impossible. You can't do it, and, and you'll just fill up people's heads. And sometimes the letting go, we're going to stop doing this, that's the biggest flag in the organization that things are going to change. We're no longer doing that. And it's, it's very, very hard to make that decision. But you, but you have to make it. You have to make it. That's, that's another very, very good question. You know, the, the, the saying is that trust is slow to grow and fast to lose. Now, you can break trust. I, I think it's all about being, tr it's transparency starts with trust. So it's about clarity, saying what you're going to do and doing what you're going to say, having a culture of openness and encouraging people to express where their doubts and, and uh and disappointments lie and trying to do something about that. And it, it's about taking some very hard decisions. That in, in, I was gonna say all organizations, in many organizations, there are processes and people that you cannot trust and you've got to deal with that. You've either got to turn them into trustworthy people or create behaviors that are trustworthy or you've got to say you can't stay in this place. And I, I think you've got to look honestly as well at how good that trust element is across the organization. And you, you get that by asking people. People are, are quite happy to tell you, I, I think asking for a, tell me how bad it is, is not a good idea. Tell me how good it is, but tell me the things that concern you still. So it's, you've got to keep it under continuous watch. You've got to set it out as we want to be a high trust organization. And funnily enough, high trust organizations build trust with customers. So that it, it runs all the way through down to the end. And, and learn how to deal with issues and problems based on the need to maintain the trust. You know, that when Coca-Cola um, launched Asani in Britain and they, they invested $90 million in the launch, they had three million bottles of the stuff stocked in every supermarket and shop in the country. And there was that discovery of a minute trace of some not very nice chemical that had got somehow got in. It wouldn't harm anybody, but it was still there. And the CEO, called the execs together, and they're all for, well, we can cover it up, we get away with it. Why don't we just say there's a problem that we've dealt with? And they went through all the reasons why the launch had to go ahead. And the CEO said, read our values. And the first value was trust, trust with our customer. They canceled the whole thing. They, they spent a fortune just ditching the whole thing. Still, still not available in the UK, but the company's still there. You know, it's possible that the company still wouldn't be there. No one would have gone anywhere near anything that they owned if they'd have breached that fundamental trust. So it, it guides you in terms of your behaviour, and it should guide your leadership behaviours as well. So it runs through the organisation. But you, you, again, you've got to build it slowly, and you've got to work out what are the things that people really drive them crazy. What are, what are the real fundamental elements of mistrust in the organisation? You've got to deal with those first, and then the smaller things will follow. But you know, look it in the eye. And it's not pleasant. None of this stuff is comfortable. And most organisations turn a blind eye, walk away, don't want to know, too hard. But if you're really serious about it, that's the, that's the place to start. Super job, thank you very much. Please, everybody, join me in thanking our speakers. Thank you so much.